Good morning, everyone. My name is Pierre, and on behalf of Childbirth, I wanted to welcome you to the patient-oriented research discussion sessions, where we aim to explore a wide array of topics related to patient engagement in research. Before getting started, I just wanted to cover a few items to help ensure that our session today uh, runs as smoothly as possible. First off, uh, when not in use, please mute your microphone to reduce any unwanted background noise and to further enhance our bandwidth capability. We also recommend that you disable your webcam during the presentation part of the session today. And of course, during the Q&A period, when we get to that at the end, uh, feel free to toggle on your camera. If you, if you wanted to only view the camera feed of the active speaker, uh, please be sure to click view in the top right corner of, the, uh, of your screen and toggle on the select speaker view uh, so that you can, just, uh, you can just see the active speaker at any given time. Uh, now, as I mentioned, we do have a Q&A period later in the session. And for us, for you to relay any input, you can certainly have the option of relaying your queries through Zoom's chat function, uh, where you can then uh, share any thoughts uh, uh, and feedback as the session goes on, of course, with uh, the group as a whole. Uh, but of course, you also have the option uh, to just select the raise your hand now option, the raise your hand option in, in the platform, where we can then call on you as we work through any uh, questions that the, that the group uh, will present to the facilitators. Now, with all that out of the way, uh, welcome again to our first pod session, uh, which aims to explore the experiences of graduate students and new research researchers as they work on patient-oriented research projects. I'll, I will momentarily hand the virtual podium over to our speakers, uh, but I wanted to first welcome our facilitators, Sam, Lena, Stephanie, and Linda, who will be sharing their perspective uh, along with Kent, our moderator, who will be guiding us through a series of prompts uh, throughout the session. And so without further ado, uh, Kent, take it away and tell us a bit about yourself. Once again, I am Kent Lofsgaard coming to you all pandemic long and for a few more days from the shores of Jericho Beach in Vancouver prior to my move to the Lonsdale Key area of North Vancouver. But uh, for those who don't already know me, I am still <laughs> a researcher, clinical educator, uh, health specialty communications uh, producer and also a patient by virtue of my lived experience of congenital cerebral palsy and pediatric asthma and I have enjoyed my time as part of the child right training team being one of the spore funded adventures that continue ever since I first came into the uh, CI CIHR universe through the founding of the BC Support Unit in the summer of 2016. Uh, thank you, Ken. That's an so, Okay, if, if we're uh, just carrying right on to the topics at hand, before we get to all that, I think we'll let our uh, panelists have a bit of a chance to introduce themselves as well. Now, we didn't choose a speaking order for this, so wh whoever wants to go first, I'm just going to call you out on my screen. And Linda, you're immediately to the left, uh, far left of my screen. So uh, Linda, why don't you go first? Tell us Great. a bit about you. Thank you, Kent. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining here today. My name is Linda Nguyen, and I'm currently a PhD candidate in the School of Rehabilitation Science and Kan Chow Center for Childhood Disability Research at McMaster University under the supervision of Dr. Yang Willem Horder. My graduate studies are focused on understanding the experiences of siblings of youth with the neurodisability disability during a transition to adulthood. And throughout my graduate studies, I partner with the Sibling Youth Advisory Council, or SIBIAC, comprised of six young adult siblings of a sibling with a disability. I've also been very fortunate to work on other patient-oriented research projects. So I'm also a graduate research assistant on one of Child Bright's projects, the Ready or Not Brain-Based Disabilities Project, which aims to co-develop and evaluate the My Ready Transition app in a randomized controlled trial. And through this project, I have the opportunity to work with the Patient and Family Advisory Council, or PFAC, comprised of youth with lived experiences with a disability and parents. 
and I'm also co-supervising an undergraduate student on a project to co-develop training materials to support youth with a disability to be engaged in research, and we work with an advisory group of four youth with a disability. And I'll pass it on to our next panelist, and to my right is Stephanie. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Stephanie. I'm an occupational therapist by background and uh, currently a PhD student at McGill University under the supervision of Dr. Dana Annaby. Um, and I'm interested in looking at the organization of rehabilitation services for transition aged youth with physical disabilities who also have uh, mental health problems. Um, and for my project, I would really like to get um, perspectives from service users and service providers. Um, to better understand the complex problem from different angles and come up with recommendations for um, better integrated rehabilitation care. Uh, so I'm at the beginning of my project and I'm currently creating a consultation committee uh, that will be comprised of youth, family members, clinicians and managers uh, to help guide my project along. So I'll pass it over to Samantha. Thanks. Um, hi everyone, I am Sam Wachinski. I know it says Samantha, but please, uh, please do call me Sam. Um, I am a postdoctoral fellow at McMaster University in the School of Rehab Sciences, working with Dr. Michelle Phoenix. Um, I'm also affiliated with Canchild and Holland Review Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. I am a registered nurse by uh, clinical training, and um, I completed my PhD in 2020 at the University of Toronto, and my uh, PhD project did not include uh, patients or families with lived experience. Um, and near the end of my project, um, I did a lot of reflection on our outcomes and um, I was taking the family engagement and research course to McMaster at the time um, and really reflected on sort of what was missing and what I could do in the future. I got really hooked um, on the idea of family and patient engagement and that led me to um, a, a research coordinator position at Holland Review, creating um, a child right funded project, uh, developing simulations. Um, and that's really how I got started in patient family engagement. And that led to my uh, child right graduate fellowship award, um, which we are delivering and evaluating the simulations that were co-built within that first project at Holland Review um, and seeing if they're, um, effective in improving the knowledge and attitudes of researchers, family members, staff, youth, um, and um, I think that's everyone, <laughs> um, to be able to uh, build um, authentic and meaningful collaboration in patient-oriented research. Um, I'm so excited to be here today, um, and I will pass it off to Lena. Thanks, Sam. Um, just if you could nod your heads that you could hear me, because I sometimes have audio issues as well. Okay, great. Uh, so my name is Lena Yanni. I'm also a PhD student at McGill University. Um, my background is in occupational therapist. I'm an occupational therapist in schools um, as well. So uh, my PhD project is under the supervision of Dr. Dana Annaby at McGill and Dr. Chantal Camden at the University of Sherbrooke. Um, and we're looking at uh, basically the, 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 the notion of collaboration between school occupational therapists and uh, teachers. Um, so it's a stakeholder guided uh, project where like uh, Stephanie, we're, we're engaging a consultation panel uh, with different stakeholders, including parents, um, school administrators, teachers, and occupational therapists uh, to look at service delivery uh, to help those collaborative practices for students who are included um, in mainstream education, students with special needs who are included in mainstream education settings. Um, so the, and the, the goal is to develop a KT, a knowledge trans translation intervention uh, training session to help uh, foster and promote these collaborative practices, but having a look at all um, viewpoints and standpoints from the different stakeholders who are involved in the school system. Uh, so I'm still very much at the beginning beginning of the project, uh, setting up the consultation panel and starting to develop these relationships with different stakeholders. Uh, so that's where we're at and hopefully we'll get to all share our, our viewpoints of, of where we're at in terms of the patient-oriented experience. So thank you. Looking forward to the discussion. I guess I'll pass it to Kent or to Pierre to start off with the questions. 
Uh, thank you, Lena. Yeah, uh, we will we will end with the cans and we'll so we'll get right into our first prompt. Right. Okay. Prompt number one. Um, what approaches have you used to connect with patients that uh, would be interested in collaborating as uh, partners? So I guess I can uh, go first. Um, as I mentioned, I'm really at the beginning stages of my project now, and I'm currently creating my consultation committee. So um, it's, it's my first time doing this. I, I was a bit uh, lost, I guess. So I, I asked um, for guidance from other researchers who are involved in uh, patient-oriented research. Um, and many of them really recommended going by word of mouth um, and creating, you know, contacts and connections um, with the people representing different institutions that I'm working with for my project. Um, for example, discussing with clinicians uh, who might have a service user in mind. Um, and what I've been uh, coming to the conclusion is that each organization works a little bit differently as well. So I've been liaising with the uh, research coordinators from each site to know how I can approach potential stakeholders um, within their setting. And to add on to Stephanie, I think that was also similar to how I approached my sibling partners. I started working with and established the Sibling Youth Advisory Council since 2018, so early on when I started my PhD. And they were also connected through me where, for example, there were two sibling partners who are part of the PFAC, and another sibling partner had a working relationship with Canchild. So what I did was I reached out to them initially and I asked if I could just have a conversation about their experiences as a sibling of a youth with disability. And we just had an informal conversation a lot of the conversations were about an hour to an hour and a half and they were all so interested about sharing their stories so I told them that I was continuing this work around siblings experiences during my graduate studies and I asked if they would be interested in partnering with me and contributing their perspectives to the research project and it was then that we started partnering together um, in my work and that was how the Sibling Youth Advisory Council was established and by word of mouth it's continued to expand over the years and now there are six members Excellent. Can, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, you go. You go first. <laughs> okay. I was gonna say I um I took a bit of a different approach um instead of word of mouth um I used a um I guess it's a service that's connected through Holland Bloorview Kids Rehab Hospital and they have a, a research family engagement committee and part of this committee is a family engagement specialist and so this service that they offer is that you can um. Uh, they give you an application form and you fill out the details of your project um, and you talk about uh, what the project's going to be, what kind of um, experience that you're looking for, um, who you're looking for to partner on your project and um, the time commitment and they you you submit the application and they help to match you with someone who would be interested in the project and so it kind of is an email blast that gets sent out to all like the family leaders at the organization um, and what I thought was a bit unique to this service is that they have um, different level I don't know if it's levels because I don't think it's hierarchical but I think it's different ways to be involved in research at the organization so they have different terms so like a family advisor a lived experience educator and a family partner and they're I think it's based on commitment and interest in how you want someone to be involved in your project. And the reason why we chose this route was because we wanted someone to be able to co-deliver the simulations. And so we wanted someone who had simulation experience and who was trained in the simulation methodology to be able to um, work with someone on our team. So when we were delivering our simulations and doing the research aspect of it, that it could be meaningful for both parents um, and researchers to learn together. And so we um, wanted someone who had that family advisor experience. And so um, having that matching service was really helpful in getting someone who was both interested in the project, but then also had 
um, an awareness of the time commitment and what sort of need that we wanted. Um, and so I think it was really helpful to um, go through this service, but I know that this isn't available at, at every organization or hospital. So I think it um, was really amazing to have it through this organization, but I, I do know that there might be challenges that this is often not an option for other people. Right, that actually uh, sounds like a similar style of a service to one that I was about to mention just before you spoke that we have here in BC called the Patient Voices Network that uh, is administered by the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council. And uh, I noticed that someone, one of our uh, attendees has mentioned in the chat that there is also a similar service that uh, Child Right offers for recruitment as well. Uh, Lena, did you have anything to offer on this topic uh, based on anything you've heard your co-panelists sure. say? Sure. I think, from? sure. Thanks, Kent. Um, I just want to, I like, I am at the beginning of our project. I know my context is a little different because I'm working in school systems and school boards. Um, I think what I've found helpful is so far is getting in touch with uh, administrators or directors of the school board um, and they're able to kind of guide me um, so let's say certain schools who may be interested in participating or they, they know, I guess, the staff and the employees um, and which schools they're at. So where to guide me and says, oh, maybe you should reach out to this school. They have a good team of people who will probably be interested in taking part in the research project. Uh, so I think that has been very helpful. Um, I think also having uh, personally, just having the background of how the system, like how the education system works, and it, it, it's different, I, I, I suppose, from school board to school board, so I suppose it's even more different or more diverse from province to province, but just having that, that uh, connection or knowing how they function, um, knowing who to reach out to first has kind of helped, I guess, streamline the whole process in recruiting and finding people who may be potentially interested as joining as uh, partners. Um, in the project. So I think that has been, I guess, fine. I guess the take home is knowing who to contact first, maybe similar to word of mouth, but knowing who to reach out to first uh, to help guide you along the way. Excellent. Thanks so much, Lena. And it's uh, really good to see that we've already got a nice exchange of uh, feedback and resources and ideas happening in the chat. Uh, if no one else has anything to add to prompt number one. Uh, Pierre, we can roll the slide on to prompt number two. Here we are. Uh, next, we'd like to hear a little bit about how uh, you have involved uh, patient partners and other relevant uh, stakeholders in your research efforts so far. Technologically speaking, Linda, it looks like, is always going to be first <laughs> on my screen. So I'm uh, happy to share. Um, and I think it really adds to Sam's point about thinking about ways that we want our patient and family partners to be involved. For me, is the sibling partners. So one of the studies that I'm currently conducting as part of my PhD studies is called the Best Sib Study, which is a study that aims to understand the experiences, including the roles and responsibilities of youth with a neurodisability during the transition from pediatric to adult health care. And so I really want to make sure that the Sibiac had opportunities, if they were interested, to be involved throughout the whole research process. So there were two tools that I used that I thought was really helpful. One was the involvement matrix that my community member, Dr. Marilyn Kedar, she worked with a group of researchers as well as youth and family partners to develop this tool. You may have already seen this tool, but this tool outlines different project tasks as well as the roles that um, patient and family partners may want to be involved with, whether it's a listener, a co-thinker, an advisor, a partner, or a decision maker. And the second tool that I use is along with um, the involvement matrix is called the engagement tool that was developed by the Ontario Brain Institute and provides different examples of the research process that um, patient and family partners may want to be involved with. And so with these tools, I had a conversation with the CIBIAC and asked them about different project tasks that they might be interested in, such as the development of the research question, outlining the study design, piloting the interview guide, developing and sharing the recruitment videos. Um, so that was actually a unique part of the study was that I co-developed these recruitment materials, which include their recruitment recruitment video and poster with the Sibiac. So the Sibiac and I brainstormed ideas for the content. They gave feedback on the language to make sure that it was appropriate. 
They want to make sure that materials were visually appealing and they share testimonial videos about um, how meaningful and relevant the study was. And I think that really helped with our participant recruitment. I can add to that because um, I also used a tool. So I um, was familiar with the involvement matrix. Um, and I also used a conversation guide that was developed by two students in the family engagement and research um, course. Um, and the conversation guide that was built was helping to provide a stage for researchers um, to be able to have a checklist, I guess, of things to talk about during that initial conversation when you're asking about how do you want to be involved. And for me, this was a really important part of uh, the developing a relationship, um, especially because I used um, a service such as the matchmaking service um, for one of my uh, youth partners. It was a new relationship. And so having conversation checklist sort of in the background was really helpful. And this conversation checklist um, went over uh, asking about sharing personal strengths and ex experience and expertise. So not just about lived experience, but also other things like hobbies or interests and things that um, the, the individual would like to be involved in that might not necessarily be specifically towards their lived experience, but thinking about how else that they could um, contribute to the project in a way that was meaningful and authentic towards um, their own experiences. And I think we'll speak to this a little bit later, but I think knowing about individuals' backgrounds and not just about their diagnosis or um, is really helpful so that they're able to contribute in a way that is uh, meaningful and adds value. And it's not just ticking a box, you're actually thinking about ways that um, involve their interests. And so I thought this tool was really helpful and I'll link it in the chat. I added in the involvement matrix as the thing, but if you have a conversation guide, Sam, I think that would be helpful to include. And I can maybe add on in terms of my experience so far with involving uh, different partners and stakeholders, um, more in terms of the, I guess, the development of the, the project itself, you know, so I had my initial idea, but I think it's really important to ensure that it's actually an important project to uh, embark on. So I presented my project and, and with those that I discussed with, you know, confirmed that it's a genuine need. Um, and it was really uh, helpful to hear some examples about kind of the, the real impacts and the, I guess, clinical cases, if you will, in terms of um, how the current organization of care um, impacts service users. Um, and uh, also for my scoping review that I'm currently working on, I uh, had some feedback in terms of different uh, things that I could uh, search, different organizations that I could potentially get information from. Uh, so it was really helpful to have the more, um, I guess, the insider look of uh, um, what could be important and where I could find relevant information. I'll just add on to this point. Um, I think like I'm just thinking about like the preliminary conversations that I've had. I think uh, I guess it's more of like a personal uh, just having like a heart to heart conversation with like I, I know there's one administrator that we've we've already started discussion and having uh, really them provide all their information that what are their their challenges that they're facing in terms of optimizing service delivery for students with special needs. Where, where are their hands tied? Where do they have their uh, difficulties? I mean, it could be related to budget, to staffing, to um, you know, structuring, like scheduling and stuff like that. Uh, so I found it interesting that when you ask these questions, um, and this is the types of questions we foresee asking you know, other occupational therapists who work in schools or speaking to teachers, and we know we're gonna get maybe similar uh, answers, but also I think varying perspectives based on the barriers that they're facing or the, or the, the either the barriers or the facilitators that they have uh, for each stakeholder group. So I think it'll just add to the richness of the of the project when we're devising something, having their input um, kind of help structure this like knowledge translation uh, training session or training sessions. Um, I think essentially the involvement the, these these important conversations, basically, what I'm trying to, to say is really I find has been helpful so far. 
uh, in these very, very early stages. So I think uh, not being scared to ask some difficult questions, I guess, like to say, listen, what would you want better? What would you want to improve? Um, what would be ideal and what's actually happening, I think, uh, are, are the questions that um, we're kind of using at this point. That's my little snippet, I guess, in terms of how to <laughs> promote more, uh, and to promote the involvement of these partners. I think that is such an important point about like knowing that having that heart to heart conversation, um, because I think for me, like having that conversation really set me up for later in the project when um, I was like ha building a survey and I wanted feedback. Um, and so like sending it to my pension partners, not just asking like, hey, can I get your feedback on this and just having them review it and check check it off. Like I asked, like knowing that one of my partners had interest in health literacy, like, you know, asking like, can you think about this based on your experience and your interest and your expertise with health literacy and also your experience within the healthcare system and with research? Like, can you look at it from both of these things, not just asking sort of like, can you just quickly review and just sign it off? Really thinking about um, their, their skills and their interests in what you're asking for um, in their involvement on your project, on the project. Yeah, I just want to add, I was once involved in another project. Uh, it was a family, uh, it was a parent partner uh, project at a hospital, uh, a rehabilitation hospital. And um, they were looking at how to, uh, I guess, in terms of the transition from coming in from a hospital where they received the diagnosis, if their child had a diagnosis of CP or DCD, and they were being admitted to the rehab hospital for therapy. So they were looking at how the services were organized and what was the parent and child experience of transitioning between, let's say, the hospital to the community to the rehab center. And I think that um, what was really interesting and really nice was when we would have the conversations with the parents, they became very invested when we'd say, what did you not like? What, what was the hardest part of it? What was it? And, you know, they would say things like, oh, it was when I got the diagnosis, I felt like I was brushed aside. Um, that I, I thought they, they talked to me as if I was supposed to understand what all these terms were, this jargon was. So it was just very enlightening. Um, and, and the more we asked these difficult questions, the more involved they became and the more open they became and the more information we, we got. So um, I think it's, it's, it's interesting or it's nice to see that when you have conversations like that that it kind of adds more uh, I guess more richness to it to the involvement and if I can add also to that but Lena and Sam you mentioned around having these conversations about their interests for me it was not only just the research project itself but I also met with each um, CIBIAC member and had a conversation about their goals and expectations just to hear more about their interests and their motivations for being involved in research. I asked questions around what are your goals for the CIBIAC, what activities would you like to see in the CIBIAC, and what activities should we continue doing? And for them, I think being a part of the CIBIAC provided a chance for them to not just be involved in research, but be, to be able to connect to each other. These are all young adult siblings. I think they haven't um, found these opportunities until they were part of the CIBIAC to connect with other young adult siblings. And so they want to share about their sibling stories. They said they want to raise more awareness about their roles um, within the community and research. And with that, that was where I realized that I wanted um, to ensure that they would be able to co-present with me at conferences because it seemed like they really want to be a part of the academic community. So I think having these conversations about their interests is really important and it helps them, like Lena was saying, about their investment and their motivations with continuing in research. This is a really excellent conversation. One of my favorite things about moderating these type of panels is the conversation that just sort of uh, arises organically among the panelists. And we've definitely <laughs> seen a strong example of that already. Uh, just before we move on to the third prompt, and I'm going to exercise my moderator's privilege here because I have kind of a burning follow-up question uh, that if any of you have any immediate thoughts on you know, what did you do differently or what kind of unexpected things happened to change your approach as, uh, you know, as a result of having uh, incorporated uh, partnerships with patients? I, 
I I could add maybe to, to that for us and to that question a little bit. Um, I wasn't I was working as like a research uh, resource at the at this rehab hospital. I'm just thinking of the parent uh, project that we were on because it was interesting that they changed what I maybe didn't change the parent involvement remained strong throughout the project, but an immediate change, I know it sounds s silly or um, they changed how parents were received in the waiting room and it changed the information. They had like a TV in the waiting room and they changed the information that they put in the waiting room uh, when parents were c coming in. It's almost like it led, it, it, I know it doesn't really answer the question in terms of how, if it changed our approach, but we were so taken aback by some comments that we got that, that we also had the director of the pediatric program on our research team. And they right away went back upstairs and they wanted to change certain things of what parents were coming in. So it was almost like, like an immediate, uh, an immediate feedback session. So, um, I, I know it doesn't really change like the approach, but it helped kind of, uh, see like the practical issues or the practical things that we could change right away. Um, you know, even like they were changing their information packets, they were already thinking, okay, hey, well, we need to develop some kind of training sessions for parents who are just coming into our hospital, uh, to receive services. How are we going to address that? So I think um, it could have like almost immediate practical implications. I don't know. Um, I think it, it also helps foster, like we were saying before, it helps promote uh, a deeper engagement too. Absolutely, it is. It's almost like you had a, like you were saying, an almost instantaneous implementation of some of the uh, preferences and the feedback uh, from your partners on the project. So that's uh, that's what we like to see is implementation in action. Absolutely. Uh, Pierre, uh, if you would, please maybe move us on to the third uh, prompt. Here we are. Uh, now we want to give you a chance to talk about any specific challenges you've encountered uh, when incorporating patient-oriented research into your approach and what strategies have you used to overcome uh, any of those uh, any of those challenges and maybe a little bit more specifically a thought that occurs to me is like what kind of things might you have had to do to accommodate your patient partners to enable them to uh, contribute fully uh, as a partner on your project Linda, you're always my far left first on my screen. Yes, I know, Kent. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking that's a very loaded question. Almost there is strategies, but also challenges. Um, I can start off with two challenges that I experienced during my graduate studies that definitely stands out to me. And we can continue the conversation from there. Uh, one of it is funding. So for the first about year and a half, there was no funding for this SIBIAC and they volunteered their time to partner my graduate studies. But I want to ensure that there was clear communication, including their goals and expectations. And then after about a year and a half, I realized how it was going. Um, their involvement was um, seemed to be more long-term was we applied together for future research funding. And the way that works for graduate students is there are often scholarships and fellowships, such as um, the Chalbright Fellowship as the panelists on here today received. Um, but what I did was in the application, I also included an budget information about ways to compensate my sibling partners. I included testimonials. I shared the application with my SIBIAC partners. And even the idea around compensation, I know that um, there's a lot of literature around that. But for me, that even with the funding, I asked my SIBIAC partners about how they would like to receive the compensation that is more than just monetary value, but also if there are other ways that they see themselves receiving the compensation. So something creative that we did was they wanted to be able to get together and to socialize, but of course with COVID-19, we weren't able to. So I provided holiday care packages, which included a mug, as well as a packet of cookies that met the dietary needs of each member. And we met virtually online together to open up the care packages together. And it was a way to celebrate our milestones at the end of the year. And we had conversations and chats for almost two hours. Um, Something that we did recently was after a webinar presentation, I provided Uber Eats gift cards and we met online virtually for dinner to celebrate our work and efforts after the webinar presentation. 
I think the second challenge is around timelines. As graduate students, we have milestones that we have to achieve in order to make sure that we finish our work on time. And when there's such a large team with um, both patient and family partners, SIBIAC members, uh, my supervisor and committee members, I want to make sure we were all on the same page. But I think that it takes a lot of time to incorporate feedback from everyone, communicate that feedback back to the team. And so what I did was with the SIBIAC members, there are certain decisions that have to be made. So I'm just very clear about communication with them and about my rationale and reasoning for continuing on with certain um, decisions as well as when I would like to have feedback from them and with a tight timeline I do communicate the reasoning for that. So those are kind of my two big challenges that I'm, I've experienced and continually still on my mind as I continue moving forward with my partnership with the CIVIAC. Just a little follow up to what you were just describing there, Linda, because you're working with siblings and uh, 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 patients with neurological conditions at the same time, uh, in, in relation to the accommodations uh, for, for full participation, a uh, follow up question that I kind of tagged on to the end of this one, is there anything that you had to do particularly in uh, navigating the relationship or the way that you would communicate with the patients and their siblings uh, distinctly uh, so, so that they would feel equally involved. So my involvement with the Sibling Youth Advisory Council is all siblings. There was, um, some of them do have the lived experience of having a disability, but their siblings are not on the council. And then my work with the PFAC is separate from my work with the CIVIAC. But in terms of their involvement, um, I don't know if this will go into touching um, around strategies, but I think just being flexible with making sure that they always have opportunities to be involved. Things like toll-free numbers, um, meetings of summaries. If they're um, not able to attend the meeting, I will offer my time to meet with them separately to have an update or a check-in, um, as well as with co-presentations, I will offer the opportunity for pre-recordings. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for that important clarification. Uh, anyone else? Stephanie, you're next on my screen. Sure. Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the uh, recruitment process, which has proved uh, quite uh, challenging. And um, I think, well, as Linda was pointing out in terms of timeline, so I think even just for the um, building connections in the first place, it's been important to be uh, patient and, and flexible with, with that. Um, and uh, being organized as well. So, you know, creating lists of people I've contacted and when and who I should follow up with and, and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's been a little bit challenging for me to have access to potentially interested uh, people. Um, so for example, the, the ethics process has stalled me a little bit in, in the creation of my committee, even though the uh, consultation committee is part of the research team, right? So it's not someone that I'm collecting data from. So anyway, so I think there's a little bit still a lack of understanding in terms of what really patient-oriented research is. Um, so I hope with time and with uh, things like this, it, it can slowly uh, improve so that everyone's on the same page. But uh, those are some of the challenges that I'm uh, that I'm currently uh, facing. I can add to sort of the ethics challenge because I've also experienced challenges with um, REP, not necessarily like with the process, but I think that there are sort of barriers that make it more challenging to include. Um, youth and family partners on research teams. So an example I have is that um, their institutional requirement to be like called a co-investigator on the project required that we submit TCPS2 certificates from all of the people who would be named as co-investigators on the project. And this is a, a, a big barrier for uh, youth and patient um, partners who it takes a lot of time to get through the TCPS2. It's there's a lot of jargon in there. And I think um, for us, it was really um, challenging to negotiate sort of what a co-investigator would look like um, in terms of the 
REB facing versus how they're involved in the project. And so I think it really made us think about what the rules are, what does a co-investigator mean versus a collaborator and how does that affect um, the value of the contribution and, and does it? And I, I think it really made us think about those roles and how we're um, outlining the, the project and um, what we're asking of um, all of the members of our research team. It's interesting how titles can sometimes uh, create both barriers and facilitators that we don't, uh, you know, that we don't intend, depending on uh, how, you know, how things are structured, how things are explained, uh, uh, welcome and participatory do people actually feel on a given team. Before we go to uh, number four, any other any other thoughts uh, on this topic to share? Uh, Lena, I see you've unmuted there. Yeah, so. I was just going to add this. It kind of piggybacking on what Stephanie and Sam just said in terms of the challenges related to recruitment. And I think what Sam mentioned in terms of defining the roles is really important. And I know as a strategy that we had uh, discussed, it was a conversation I had with the, our supervisors, and they they and knowing, like I mentioned before, knowing. Um, Having connections, pre-established connections with uh, the institutions or the organizations that you're 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 addressing or you're targeting, um, but then creating a letter or not a contract, but a letter that's really transparent and outlining, well, you know, as a partner, this is your time commitment. Uh, these are the meetings that we'd like you to take part. Approximately, you know, on a monthly or let's say throughout the year, how many meetings? Um, uh, what your roles and responsibilities? If they're if they're going to be looking at data, what does the data look like? Um, what what would they have to read? How long would these readings be? Um, we tried to write something like, and it's a very long letter as we're kind of like writing it out. But I think it's important that they know um, what what it entails to be a stakeholder partner. And I think that's. You know, you'll see people who are very invested, very interested in the topic or in the project uh, or in the research will be like, this sounds great. This is exactly what I want to do. Maybe they, they, they have an interest in taking part in research, uh, research oriented methods. And um, I think being clear is a strategy um, is a strategy to, to employ to help with the recruitment, the recruitment challenge. And Just like we often do, I'm seeing interesting things pop up in the chat. <laughs> as they will in these uh, live uh, and interactive kinds of uh, educational offerings that we try to bring to you. And someone in the chat has just asked a very pertinent question about any challenges with retention? Like, have you had ever anyone that started out from the very beginning thinking that it was gonna be a certain kind of thing and then they got to a, a certain point uh, down the road and said, oh, wow, you know, I didn't know it was this. This isn't really for me. <laughs> or, or they had difficulty, uh, uh, you know, you know, maybe having the 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 resources or the endurance or the time commitment to stay engaged. Any thoughts? I can add on my thoughts before Kent calls on me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <There you> go. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. But I was going to say that. And with both the SIBIAC, and this is something I also learned from the PFAC, is that there are times when people aren't able to be committed to the project. So especially for projects over a long period of time. Um, so for example, the PFAC is on a project that's um, been over five years now. And with the SIBIAC, I started working with them since 2018. And I think there are times when people are not available to be a part of it. So they will take a leave and they'll just step back from the project, but jump into the project at a later point in time. So not so much retention, but I haven't had the experience of um, patient partners and family partners specifically leaving, but more in terms of they needed to take time away from the project or can't be involved. But when they do come back to the project, um, they we can, so myself as well as the coordinators uh, working with the PFAC, um, just thinking about ways to bring them back to the project and ways that they want to be involved. And I think being flexible with providing that opportunity is important especially with my work with the SIPIA partners, for example, a lot of them are still in school or at work and there are times when they're just readjusting to new schedules and they'll need to take time off from the project. And so that kind of does speak to the, uh, you know, endurance and time commitment challenges that I was asking about just before. Um, 
if there are no other immediate thoughts uh, on those follow-up questions, we'll go to sort of our uber multi-part question of the uh, of the morning, uh, being prompt number four. Um, obviously, we know that patient partners uh, bring a whole lot of unique perspectives uh, based on their lived uh, experiences, and uh, I guess four A of of these. Uh, follow-up questions that we have aside from an approach informed by lived experience are there other pertinent skills that patient partners can bring uh, to the project I certainly know what my personal answer to this question would be but uh, I'm interested to know what you've heard uh, from your own partners uh, based on their experiences I can start us off um, and I think uh, yes absolutely there are other pertinent skills, but I think the caveat to that is that it depends on the patient partner. And I think that you really need to be able to ask and everyone is unique and diverse and they have their own um, unique skills and experience and expertise that they bring to a project. And I think being able to ask people about what they're interested in and what their hobby is and their, their skills are, I think is such an important Part. I, I don't think that like as researchers, we can say like we need X, Y, and Z skills. I think a lot of skills are transferable. Um, but I think that like having someone who is really passionate about something on the on the team, if it's design or if it's um, writing in a lay language or whatnot, I think that having, knowing that experience, it can really help um, them shine because you're asking about their strengths and what what they bring is their strength to their project and I think knowing that can really make the project the best it can be but also really value their contributions in such a meaningful way so I think absolutely there are pertinent skills I don't think we could really create a list because I think every project and every person is so unique and really that underscores the importance of having those conversations at the outset so we can figure those out and so we can be able to bring those into the project. Some of that is part of the element of surprise that, that, that we touched on before about uh, different kinds of attributes uh, that uh, patient partners can bring uh, to the team. Yeah, uh, and I, you had just to, to um, continue with your point, I mean, I think that brings a lot of richness as well. Um, and to echo a little bit what uh, Sam was saying, uh, I think it's really important to, at the, even the onset of the project and as you're ideally co-developing it together, um, it's important to have a, kind of an orientation or, but it, I really see it more as a two way thing, not like me saying, okay, this is my project and can you help me, but really more as a, you know, a true partnership of like, okay, let's build this together and this is what I can contribute and this is what you can contribute and, um, you know, um, uh, in terms of, uh, and Linda also mentioned it earlier too, the sharing the, the person's goals and, and hopes, um, in addition to their, um, different lived experiences and also other experiences uh, in their life. But I think this kind of initial orientation phase, if, if we can call it that, it's it's important to have uh, the discussion just to make sure that everyone's sort of speaking the same language and and um, agrees on some some common goals and, and how we're going to all work together. Um, and I think also um, what a, a stakeholder committee can can bring or, or other um, uh, uh, stakeholders can bring to the the team is that they can help ensure that the project remains really uh, clear and accessible um, and and grounded into the like why this is important and you know what Lena was saying earlier about kind of implementation and it's, it's nice to have projects and paper research papers and so on but at the end of the day we want it to create some some change and, and improvement right so I think that um, sometimes they can help bring, at least bring me down to, to reality in the more concrete, um, yeah. So patient partners can, off, can often uh, contribute to what I call a benevolent system of checks and balances <laughs> to the process, which is, uh, which is really excellent. Um, if there are no other immediate thoughts based on prompt 4A, we'll go right to 4B, which kind of speaks to part of what you were just talking about uh, just earlier, Sam, about uh, uh, you know some challenges maybe with some of your partners having to take the uh, Tri-Council policy statement uh, curriculum that isn't exactly a newbie friendly curriculum so much. So it raises the question, is there a baseline level of research readiness that's useful when patient partners start collaborating on a project and 
if so, how have you oriented these partners uh, to uh, maybe the more technical parts of the research process? Thanks for sharing earlier, Sam, about your experience with the TCPS2 for your patient partners. I've never experienced that myself before. I think the approach mm -hmm. that I take, uh, as well as working with the research team, is that it's part of a, it's almost like a journey with them, so an opportunity to co-learn together. And I've been so fortunate to learn from the PFAC and the coordinators, Barb Galupi and Sonia Strom. And Barb added in the chat about the use of the terms of reference, which I also see how others have said that it's useful. And so the onboarding process is really providing some information and background about the project, um, different roles and tasks that members would like to be involved with, how many members are already on the committee, or how would they like to participate in the project, as well as expectations, such as attendance at monthly meetings. And I think that's where it's that opportunity to even ask them if there are skills. For example, some of them may already have skills in terms of their background or they may have experience in research that they might like to bring to the project. Um, and I think in terms of that baseline level of research readiness, um, some patient and family partners are really interested in learning about the research process and they may not have the background knowledge about it, but they really want to learn. So recently I've been co-supervising a project that's led by undergraduate students, Meta Dong at McMaster University to co-develop training materials for youth and young adults. And so during the first phase of the project, we conducted interviews and right now we're analyzing those interviews and so in this project, we partner with the advisory group of four um, youth members and two of them, um, well, yeah, I believe there was um, two of them, as well as a parent partner on the project are really interested in coding and learning about coding. And so with my experience in qualitative analysis, I created a short 10 minute video tutorial to explain about the process of coding. And we'll be having meetings to go through that process of what coding looks like for these interview transcripts. So I think that if there's patient partners who are really interested in learning, is think about as researchers, how do we provide those opportunities and help them build those skill sets? Really, really excellent. Um, other thoughts? Sam, did you have more to add uh, based on the uh, you know, research readiness uh, question? Are you asking me, Ken? No, Sam. Sam. Oh, Sam, good. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a fly on the wall. Okay, good. Sam sort of rhymes with Dan, but uh, no, <laughs> Sam is on our panel today, and you had uh, Sam, you had touched on this uh, just earlier, so I wondered if you had more uh, more to add. I don't know if I necessarily have more to add about examples, but I think that the idea of research readiness um, goes along with like what Linda had shared. I think it is a journey, and I think it goes back to like really understanding where um, your patient, your youth partners are at with, in, with respect to research and what their understanding is. And if they want to be trained in different aspects, because I think we could make the assumption that they need to have experience to be able to partner, but I don't think that's necessarily always true. I think that sometimes um, partners want to just provide consultation or aspects. And I think it really goes back to like, that setting expectations, setting the commitment to the project and understanding where and how patient partners would like to be involved in the project. And sometimes that doesn't necessarily include training. I, I, I think that um, it is this assumption that we make that there needs to be some kind of um, baseline level, but I think having an understanding of research at a basic sense um, is, is helpful. And I think we can um, definitely train along the way as our researchers, but I think it is our responsibility as researchers to be able to make that assessment, to have those conversations, to really understand where um, our patient partners are coming from and what their interest and their experience level is at. So I, I don't know if that necessarily answers the question, but I think it really goes back to this idea that we need to be open and flexible and have a, a curiosity and an understanding and have that stance throughout the whole project so that we can address these issues, not issues, but these, these along the way. 
Right, absolutely. I think we do need to do all of those things. And one of the mistakes, in a sense, that I have often made in terms of assumptions uh, myself is that I would like to believe that every, uh, you know, every, every person with a, a, you know, neurological condition or disability that might ever <laughs> engage in anything to do with healthcare education or uh, uh, you know, research, health research of any kind has an interest in uh, continuing that on into some sort of, uh, you know, career level pursuit uh, so that there can be <laughs> more, more folks like me that are engaged across the, uh, you know, the landscape. But, uh, you know, it isn't always true <laughs> in every, in every case that, uh, you know, everyone will want to do this uh, on a, on a career level uh, kind of kind of uh, degree of engagement, and which that kind of ties into uh, the last of our sub prompts here, uh, and so many of these maybe could be a session of their own for future conversation. But just to begin to touch on some of these issues today, if a lot of the patient uh, engagement landscape has tended to presume that the patient partner's perspective is meant to be a layperson's perspective. How does the professionalization of the patient partner uh, detract or not <laughs> from their perspective? I could give uh, <laughs> my opinion for, for this one. Um, um, I, I think I'll speak more on my past experience with the patient, uh, sorry, the parent partner group that we were part of. Um, I, I don't think that it would detract them from their perspective. I think it would actually empower them um, when they, if they adopt this professionalization role that when they feel that they're being, um, that their, their concerns are validated, that they have a voice, I think it, 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 it almost um, strengthens their role as a parent or a patient partner within the research team, um, I think they become, I, I mentioned it before, uh, they become more invested. Um, I think too, like I'm just thinking about, we had a we had done focus groups and it was co-led with one of the parent partners with other parents. And I think they took on the role um, of being the, the extended voice of the parents in the focus group. And I think they felt like they were making contributing i think stephanie used the word before they were contributing to the, the project but also con like being the voice for these parents who are also taking who are giving their voicing their their thoughts their concerns in the in the focus group so i think having that role of, of being uh, carrying them i don't know how else to put it but they were carrying these uh these parents voices forward um as the project progressed so i don't i mean I don't think that it takes away from their perspective if they take on this professionalization role. And I think this goes, I guess, with the previous prompt in the sense of the research readiness. And it is a journey they are learning as well. Um, and they're learning about the research process. And I think it, it, it just adds, if it's a person who's invested in the project, they're learning and they're, they're grateful uh, to be in these skills. And we're grateful as researchers or as students uh, to hear from them as well. So I think it's just a very, um, it, there's a nice flow to it for both the researcher and the, the patient care or parent partners. Yeah, I, I definitely say here, here to, to a lot of that. Uh, Lena, thank you for sharing. And, uh, you know, I think that we will continue to find that even in the cases where the uh, patient partner perspective maybe starts out as a layperson's perspective, the more that they are engaged on these type of projects and in these type of patient engagement circles, the more professionalized they will naturally uh, you know, become. So I think that that's a, you know, an important consideration for the future of patient engagement and patient research. Um, any other thoughts on the last of these prompts before we go to the next slide? Okay, <laughs> we're, we're, we're uh, getting into the home stretch of our time together today. And this is, uh, this is uh, any time that the, the audience uh, can, can either just unmute themselves and just ask a question or pop uh, questions into the chat. Uh, Pierre, I'll look to you to keep, a, you know, to keep an eye on that. But uh, anybody with any immediate thoughts is welcome to unmute themselves if they have questions for our uh, panelists. Also, I like to kind of use this time to allow for the possibility that the panelists uh, 
beyond the degree that you already have done this as part of the natural conversation today, but if you have questions that have arisen for each other, even just among the speakers, uh, I think this is an excellent time uh, you know, for that to be brought forward as well. Uh, so wherever we want to start with that. Uh, Perfect, Kent. Uh, thank you. Um, so we do have, yes, yeah, so as we mentioned, uh, feel free to uh, uh, input your, let me just stop our share screen so you can see everyone's faces. Um, uh, feel free to enter your, your input to our sort of chat box. So if you wanted to, to raise your hand, we can definitely call on you as, uh, as, as that occurs. Uh, we do have a few questions we can circle back to that kind of uh, popped up uh, during our session. And I believe Stephanie's answered the, the first one so far, uh, but I'll put it out to the rest of the panel. And if you had any uh, additional comments to add, that would be great. Uh, so the first question comes from uh, Vanessa. I was asking a question uh, just to regarding you know, feasibility as, as a trainee. So the question is, have you ever experienced pushback from supervisors, com committee members, et cetera, regarding timelines and uh, the cost uh, for patient-oriented research? If so, how did you overcome this? Um, or how did you adjust uh, the, the timelines or your, your expectations about funding uh, to, to, to address the, some of those limitations? I, th I think Stephanie mentioned it, but I think I'm just going to reiterate what um, she she wrote, I think, in the chat. Uh, similarly, I think it's it's having those understanding of the timelines and being a bit more flexible. I think uh, when you're engaging in, in POR, it, it I think it's like, I don't know, you need more time to kind of um, to, to create those relationships and to be flexible and adaptable to uh, different stakeholders' uh, schedules and timing. Um, so I think it's it's a matter of, of having those conversations with your supervisors and saying to to develop these connections and to have this. You know, it's you're also building trust, right? You're trying to build those connections with uh, with these with people with different individuals from different backgrounds, and you want to show an invested. Uh, it's an investment of time as well, not just. The grant money, but <laughs> it's been a as well. And I think also for me earlier on was having these discussions with my supervisory committee members and making, um, for example, the SIBIAC was smaller. I originally started with two members. So making sure that it was manageable, that you don't want such a large group um, with so much feedback, but even starting off with one or two members um, could be helpful to understand what that process is like. And slowly I started expanding the subject once I started learning more a little bit about the process and how to build these relationships. Uh, another part was having kind of updates. So like Bina was saying, having um, clear communication and being flexible with timelines. Um, is important. And when I work with my SIBIAC partners, I also explain to them that it's my first time. I'm a graduate student. Um, and I think that helps with establishing clear communication about timelines. Really, really excellent. Thanks again so much. Uh, Pierre, what, what, what other gems might we have uh, waiting for us there in the chat that haven't That's already been perfect. addressed? Perfect. Yeah. So we still have one more question, uh, and, and this one comes to us from Amanda, who is asking about whether any whether any of our panelists uh, have someone who have who have experienced a who have a lived experience uh, that are actually on their advisory committee overseeing their uh, their thesis work. Yeah, so I'm saying by, by the nods, that, that can seem to be uh, something that, that's common. Uh, but I'm really hoping that um, uh, as uh, we more authentically engage with patient, patient partners, that this would be something we start seeing a lot more of in the, uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote in the chat that uh, on my end, unfortunately, I, I don't, but I think that would be really, really wonderful. And maybe it speaks a little bit to one of the points that Sam brought up earlier as well in terms of um, kind of um, the ethics or just and Kent was mentioning it too in terms of like titles and like who can be considered you know part of the be considered a member of the advisory committee and what you know other um yeah titles do they have to have in order to be eligible for that position and so yeah I think it's it's pretty bureaucratically complex but I hope that um that becomes less so because it would be really uh valuable 
I'm not sure. Uh, so I'm not sure if you have any thoughts to add to that, Kent. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think that uh, you know, <laughs> I, I want to believe that just like other things that we feel really passionately about, that uh, patient-oriented research is uh, you know getting better and better as uh, you know as time goes on, and that we're uh, learning from our strengths and weaknesses and mistakes, uh, you know, along you know along the way. But I think that uh, just like the other elements of our evolving learning health system, which is basically sort of a process wheel through which every element of the health and science system learns from every other element of the health and science system to inform best practices, patient care, and, and optimize patient outcomes. And certainly patient-oriented research is no different in that sense because research is what informs at its best, it informs best practices, patient care. And we obviously want it to continue to do that as well as possible. Great, uh, thank you, Ken. So I'm not seeing any other hands up or any other uh, prompts being submitted to the chat box. So uh, let's quickly switch back to our, our screen. Uh, and yes, I guess we're winding down. We're, the, we're, we're nearing the end. Uh, I just want to thank you all for, for attending. Uh, today's session. This is our, our first inaugural uh, hosting of the of these pods, and we're hoping to develop them more um, over the uh, over the next uh, next few few years. And if you have any feedback, we certainly want to invite your input uh, in terms of uh, structure, uh, topics, or any specific areas you want to see explored in, in future sessions. Um, and just if you haven't signed up yet, we have our next session coming up in uh, November that will be touching a bit on available training resources that you might be able to employ uh, within your, your project. And of course, it goes without saying, I just want to thank our, our, our facilitators today, Linda, Stephanie, Lena, uh, and Sam, and of course, Kent for, for working us through all of those prompts. Um, hope you all have uh, an enjoyable rest of your day and we look forward to uh, connecting with you again real soon. And we'll be sure to uh, follow up with uh, all of our attendees today uh, and circulate a recording of the session, uh, as well as uh, some of the great resources uh, that have been shared with us in the, uh, in the chat box today. So thank you again very much. Have a great day and we will chat again soon. Bye-bye.